Hello, it is painfully hot right now, um, at least in the UK it is. Um, now, saying that, um, it's painfully hot in the UK, uh, I know I have members on the Discord from, uh, from uh, USA, from, uh, from India, from Australia, uh, where they experience actual hot temperatures, and where if I told them the temperature that it's reaching in Britain, they would laugh and scoff at the idea of being hot. But remember that no one in the UK has air conditioning, including me. It doesn't exist in the UK because it doesn't get hot enough to to warrant it. But what it does mean is when we do have a day where it like, nips even slightly above like 20 degrees C, um, we actually start to feel it because we can't turn the air conditioning on because we don't have any. So when you have like a week where the temperatures are routinely topping out at over 25 degrees C, you really start to feel it. Anyway, enough of that. This video is my top five most intimidating books. These are books that I want to read, uh, I've planned to read, and I look at them and I get anxiety, I get palpitations. I, I go, oh, maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'll read something a bit lighter. Maybe now's not the right time. And uh, I feel like this all the damn time with these books. Some of them I've tried to read, some of them I've got a little bit into, some of them I've DNF'd, others I've never even opened. And I've got five of them here. Now, these are all intimidating books. These are all books that I look on and I go, yeah, that these these are gonna these are gonna smart, but um, that doesn't mean that they're they're bad books. Um, in fact, I wouldn't own them if I if I hadn't had them recommended to me and I didn't think that they were potentially very good books. So, whilst I find them intimidating and I have reasons, um, I'm hoping <coughs> that people will be able to look at these books and go, okay. That's understandable intimidation, there's a good reason there, but maybe you'll enjoy it because of X, and maybe by getting these out and uh, speaking about them, I can dispel some of that uh, uh, some of that intense feeling that these books are just way too much. <laughs> so the first one, uh, this will come to no shock to people who know my channel, because um, this was a buddy read that I DNF'd, and that is Stephen Erickson's Gardens of the Moon. Specifically, the entire Malazan Book of the Fallen series. Because it doesn't seem that huge, but these are extremely thin pages, and this is very small print and very dense print. These are big books, and you can't read them fast. Like, you have to spend time reading slowly, like, possibly reading a chapter, then rereading that chapter to make sure it all sunk in. Um, I know because I've read the first few chapters of this book and it doesn't sink in easily. It's well written, it's interesting, and I've heard fantastic things about it, but um, I don't know what to think about this. Um, the writing style seems to work for me. Um, the fantasy aesthetic seems to be exactly the kind of thing I would enjoy. This should be a book that would be a favourite of mine. It feels like I'm reading someone's very well-made, well-constructed, intricate D&D campaign, which might not appeal to everyone, but as someone who's played role-playing games, including D&D, for um, the best part of 20 years, that appeals to me quite a lot. Um, I enjoy that hobby, um, so having a story that feels like that, only edited and well-constructed, so that you get the best part of that uh, that dynamic, but you don't get all the tedious shit, that sounds like it'd be perfect for me. The intimidation comes from the complexity. It is not an easy read. The next book is uh, a similar kind of situation, and that is Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe. This is volume one, and this is volume two. Um, it could have been one book, I suppose. Um, I'm sure you can get it bound up as a single book. Um, 
and apparently you can get it. Um, you can get it in fours. You can get it separated into four books as well, um, because yeah, it's uh, each of these uh, volumes is separated into two. Um, so this first volume is. Um, let's check. These pages are really thin. Uh, the Shadow of the Torturer and the Claw of the Conciliator. So, The Shadow of the Torturer is the one I've heard a lot about, but The Book of the New Sun. So it's more of a series than an actual book. Um, but it's... It looks like it's one book, the way that it's uh, portrayed here. And then, uh, Volume 2 is The Sword of the Lictor and The Citadel of the Autark. So, it, is it four short books, or is it one... Large book. It's kind of a Lord of the Rings situation. Is the Lord of the Rings one book or is it three books? <clears throat> Excuse me. The author intended Lord of the Rings to be one book. Um, and may have been published as, as three, but if you look at the divisions in it, it's actually divided into six, which is what um, which is what uh, J.R.R. Tolkien wanted when he, when he was told by his publisher he couldn't have it as one book. Um, so... I consider Lord of the Rings to be a single book, but I could also see people arguing that it's three or six. Same with Book of the New Sun. Um, is it one? Is it two? Is it four? Who knows, really? What intimidates me about the Book of the New Sun is everyone I've heard talk about this has said that it is trippy. It is um, filled with allegory. It is... Um, it is very uh, abstract in the way it tells its story. It's supposedly a sci-fi story. Um, it's part of the sci-fi masterworks collection. And yet, um, it is described as one of the greatest fantasy epics of all time. And that's a quote by George R.R. R. Martin on the, on the front of the book. So is it a fantasy epic? Is it science fiction? It looks like sci-fi. It looks like uh, fantasy. Um, it's about a torturer's apprentice and his guild. It, there's swords and magic by the sounds of it. But there's also um, claims that it's it's based in a far future and that there's it's actually post-far um, future exploration where uh, all that future technology was lost and people are rebuilding it and maybe the magic isn't actually magic but it's just the interpretations of technology by a group of people who don't understand the technology if that's the case is this the real world are we are we exploring a solar system that was later colonized from people who left earth thousands and thousands maybe millions of years ago um, is that even still science fiction at that point that's not really exploring a scientific principle that's just um, extrapolating out from our own universe so that you can claim that it's got a vague connection to the real world rather than claiming that it's a completely new fa a fantasy world when clearly it is a completely new fantasy world. Um, I've also been told that it, it includes time travel. I don't know if that's true. Um, it includes time travel or alternate realities or that there's hints that it might include time travel or alternate, uh, alternate realities and if that's the case how does that work into the story? Um, it sounds so complex and it sounds extremely complex for something that's only this long. Like, it's not long enough to be as complex as people make it out to be. That's 595 pages. And volume 2 is... 600 and... 615 pages. So... 1,210 pages. That is shorter than than a single Stormlight Archive book. And yet all the different parts that is apparently involved in this is being told in something that honestly would, would struggle to tell one of the concepts that I've heard is apparently in this. Um, it is intimidating as all hell. Because I'm expecting so much from it. And I don't think it can live up to it. And it's not new. It's quite old. Which means the language is probably going to be fairly dated. It's not going to be easy to read. Like, When was this originally published? I think in the, in the 1980s? 
Or is it newer than that and I'm just mixing it up with something else? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Shadow of Torture, 1980. Uh, and the last one was 1983. So this is early 80s. This is going to be difficult. It's going to have some dated language in this. <clears throat> I don't know how, how well I'm going to take to these books. And for some people, these are considered the very, very best of the genre. These are some of the best science fiction I've ever read. And I'm like, is it even sci-fi? How can this be the best sci-fi you've ever read? When it sounds like outlandish abstract fantasy. Are you sure it's not the best fantasy you've ever read? So, I, I do not know what to expect at all going into this. Like People who claim they don't like fantasy have said this is one of their favourite books. I am completely confused. So... What, where do I take that? Book three in my most intimidating reads. Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. This is a monster of a book. Um, again, it doesn't look quite so huge, but it is... Um... Let's see, how many pages? It is... These pages are like Bible pages that are that thick. That's the about the author page, so we can ignore that. Okay. It is 1,069 pages long. And at 1,069 pages long, like 1,069, but I can hold it in one hand, it is Bible page thickness. It's also Bible page script. Look at that! Like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're looking at 13 words per line, so that is way more than average. Most books, it's around 9 to 11. This is 13 to 14 words per line. And it's... Forty one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, fifty one lines per page. That is how tiny this is. Fifty one lines per page. Most books are around thirty to thirty five lines per page, depending on the size of the margins. This is a mass market paperback. It's smaller than the average book. This is mass market, 51 lines, 13 words per line. That is ridiculous. But we're not even talking, we're even talking a thousand pages of Sanderson level texts here. Like, this is as many pages as any of the Sanderson books I've got, and about twice as many words per page. Right, 51. There's also not a single chapter break. There is occasionally a line, uh, uh, like a double line break, um, and then we get like two dots and then a double line break, and then it goes straight back into text. Like, the chapters are like 300 pages long, because I've just found the beginning of part two. Like, this book is fucking huge. It's 600 words a page. 600 words per page. Average. At my reading speed, that's one page. Every three minutes, because I, I guarantee this is not one that I'm reading at high speeds. Like, 
this is one where my reading speed's going to drop back down to like the 220 words per minute level. Like, I'm looking, I'm looking at barely getting through a page every three minutes. It's 640,000 words. This book, this book, I've just worked out what take me, that can't be right. I'm going to do the maths again. I'm, I've got to calculate it. I'm going to do the maths again. It can't be that much. 600 words per page, 1,069 pages, 640, 1,400 words. Okay, divide that by a reading speed of 220 words per minute. It's 2,915 words per minute. Okay. Okay. Um, that doesn't help. What, why, why, I'm, I'm confusing myself now. This is what happens when you discuss, um, when you discuss intimidating reads. So, we've got... All of these words... Um, divide that by the number of words per minute will give me how many minutes it will take me to read it. So, if I divide that by 220 words per minute, then it will take me 2,915 minutes to read it. Um, so divide that by 60 to get the number of hours. I was right. 48 hours. 48. Two fucking days. Of nothing but reading. I didn't believe it. Like, the amount of books are like eight hours worth of reading. Close to 50! <sighs> that, that would be enough to make this an intimidating as hell read. But it's not just that. This is the libertarian text. Like, this is... Objectivism. Uh, object. <sighs> I can never say the bloody word. Uh, this is basically Ayn Rand's philosophy in novel form. Um, it is a heavily politicized text where she explains the objectivist philosophy and um, explains her society as she sees it. Now, as a libertarian, this is a book that I should read. It's a book that I should be familiar with. It's a book that I should understand. Because not only is it the biggest um, statement for libertarianism, it's also the biggest argument against it. If I want to be able to argue the libertarian mind, mind, mindset, the libertarian viewpoint, I need to be able to see what the extremes of that viewpoint is, so that I can then describe how I agree and how I disagree with it. This is a book I need to read in order to complete my personal uh, political identity. In order for me to be able to espouse the opinions I believe, I should understand the people who came up with the baseline of what I believed, uh, of what I believe, and then how that was derived upon in order to come to modern day libertarianism, which is what I tend to believe. How can I do that? if I haven't read one of the seminal works that led to that ideology. It's something I have to read. So, that's one. This next one is nowhere near as huge and um, time-consuming and personal as Atlas Shrugged. But it's one that I really do need to read. It's one I want to read. It's one I'm excited to read. But it's one I can't read yet. Um, and it's, it's one that is bizarre in that for me to be able to read this next book, I need to be well read in about four different genres. Because I know enough about the author and the writing process of this book that I feel to properly appreciate it. I need to understand a lot of where the 
um, the intent for this book came from, and that is The Forgetting Moon by Brian Lee Durfee. One of my favourite YouTubers. <clears throat> this is a monster of a book. I mean, look at the size of it. It's fucking huge. And it's a big, beefy boy as well. Thing is... Look at that text. That's a lovely and huge text with big margins. Right. That's one, two, three, four... One, two, three. Then one, two, three, four. Okay, so we're looking at an average of 11 words per page. Yeah, 11 words per line, sorry. Lines. One, two, three. Thirty-three lines per page. A normal amount! A normal amount around... 330 words per page, which means one page of this is just about half a page of this. Um, this thickness means nothing compared to this. Like, Brian Lee Durfee's book looks huge. It is dwarfed by the hugeness of this. So why is this so damn intimidating for me? Well, it may be big print, and it may be, um, yeah, it, it may be an epic, a big fantasy epic, uh, but it's only actually around seven. Uh, it's just under eight hundred pages long, so it's not actually that long. Um, I've read a Sanderson book, so I don't need really to worry too much um, about big books. I can handle them. Um, I could easily read this book, but to read this book. I would need, it's 763 pages, it's really not that long, it just, it's a big, big, chunky book, because um, it's a big floppy paperback, it's a really, really nice big floppy paperback, uh, one of the nicer books to read from. Now, for me to be able to read that, I feel like I need to read about 20 other novels first. Um, I, I listen to Brian Lee Durfee talk about his influences, and what he's trying to accomplish, and I feel like... I can't really get anything from that until I've read, like, major fantasy epics, um, historical fantasy, sci-fi, westerns. There's so much that he, he draws from in this book. Like, he openly says he draws from Moby Dick. I've not read Moby Dick. Um, he mentions he draws from Shogun. Shogun's fucking huge, it's over there. Right, for... <sighs> This book isn't this book. This book is Moby Dick and Shogun and Pillars of the Earth and the entire Wheel of Bloody Time trilogy and uh, all of A Song of Ice and Fire and so many, so many more books <laughs> that have all led to him being able to write this because he's so well read and so well uh, connected to so many different genres that for you to get what he's doing with this... You kind of need the background of all those other books to really appreciate everything that he's t he's talking about. Um, and I think that that's going to make me feel like I'm getting a lesser experience because I am not well read enough to understand all those references, all those um, all those little bits where it's not even references; it's it's inspirations. Those scenes were. He takes a trope and then spins it around a bit and alters it. I'm not going to recognise the tropes. I'm not going to recognise the character archetypes that he's playing with. Because I've not read the books that he's using as an inspiration. And it makes me look at that book and go, that book represents the end game of reading all of these books that I need to get through. So that's what makes that one so intimidating for me. The last book. This is um, this is an intimidating read for a lot of people. It's probably topping most people's lists, um, and it won't be a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, this one, uh, I have a very specific one 
Uh, and this is, again, thanks to Brian Lee Durfee that I own this. I actually own multiple copies of this, including an e-book copy of exactly this, uh, this book. And I say exactly this book. Uh, you'll understand why in a moment. Um, that sticker's not coming off. Oh, well. Um, let's see, can I peel it from this end? Hmm. That's really annoying. Bloody stickers. Um, it's actually annoying because it's over a specific name that I want to be able to read out. There we go, that's enough. I can see the name. That's all I need. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So, this, uh, this last book is War and Peace. Now this is specifically the complete and unabridged, translated by Anne Dunnigan. Now, this is a battered, broken, bent as fuck, mouldy old book. It is yellowed and it's horrible and I have a second paperback version on my shelf over there which is in slightly better condition but it's still kind of horrible. Um, and if I can ever get a decent quality of exactly this book, I will because I want a high quality copy of this one. I also have the ebook version of this book, specifically this translation of War and Peace. I have another version of War and Peace. I haven't read that one either. The reason I sought out of this translation is because Brian Lee Durfee actively uh, sought out this one and promotes this one. He says that other translations are crap. He does not rate them highly. He does not consider them worthwhile. Um, this is the translation that he suggests um, and it's the translation I want to read because he says that this one maintains the beauty of the original Russian um, by not translating perfectly, but God, the book smells weird as well. It's, it is not going to be pleasant to try and read from this. Um, I'm going to have to... Uh, I'm just going to have to bear with it, though. Um, but yeah, um, he says, This translation is worth it because it maintains the beauty of the prose. It translates the, the beauty of the, uh, the original into the English in a way that makes it an enjoyable read, whereas other translations just go utilitarian and ruin the uh, the beauty that is War and Peace, because apparently War and, Pe War and Peace is one of the best novels ever written. I don't know. I've not read it. Now, I tried to read it. Not that translation, though. I tried to read one of the other translations. I found it stodgy and difficult to read. I was 15. I got about a quarter of the way in, and I wasn't a big fan of it, if I'm honest. The thing is, I was 15, and I was reading what I now believe to be a bad translation based on what Brian Lee Durfee says on his channel. So, if that's the case, this is a book I need to give another try to. I've heard that it's been described as being the historical fiction, Russian Revolution um, equivalent of... Uh, Game of Thrones level uh, Machia Machiavellian um, intrigue uh, and if you're a fan of something like A Song of Ice and Fire you should love this um, and I am so I should love this and yet I can't bring myself to pick this up this is one intimidating as hell read not just because it's big and it's thick and it's massive but because I should love this book and what if I don't what if I try to read this? What if I put dozens of hours into trying to read this dense classic of Russian literature? One of the most prized and respected books ever written. That is written in a style that I have been told by people who I trust should meet my tastes. That is designed around things I like that discuss warfare and 
a historical um, a, a historical period that fascinates me. Politics and intrigue, uh, areas that I find really interesting. This should be the perfect book for me. And it might not be. I might not like it. And that would raise so many questions. Because if I don't like this book, it's probably not the book, it's probably me. It's for that many people to love this book, for that many people who have the same taste as me to love this book. If I don't love it, surely it's not the book's fault at that point, it's mine. And I'm not sure if I'm ready for that kind of, for that kind of all or nothing um, reflection on my ability to uh, to read, digest, analyse a novel, and um, and come out with a an answer as to whether or not my tastes are justifiable, whether or not my my um, sense of self respect, my sense of uh, personal uh, identity is true because if I can't enjoy War and Peace when I actively enjoy military high fantasy and political intrigue then I'm lying to myself about what I enjoy either, either I don't really enjoy those genres and all the books that I've read in those genres that I claim to have enjoyed I didn't enjoy them for those reasons. Or worse still, I didn't understand it. It went over my head. And I'm just too fucking stupid to have it fill in. Uh, to have it coalesce to crystalline in my head. That would be such an ego blow. I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that. So yeah, that's my most anticipated, uh, that's my most um, intimidating read. I do anticipate this read, I do want to read it, I do want to enjoy it. But it is so intimidating on a level that no other book can be. The Forgetting Moon feels like it's an obligation to read so much of the genre. Um, Atlas Shrugged is a, a political piece that I suspect is going to be groundbreaking in forming part of my understanding of libertarian and conservative values to such a degree that having not read it makes me feel like my political identity is incomplete. But at the same point, if I don't like this, it's fine. If I love this, it's also fine. If I find I love this and that this resonates with me, it confirms that I am indeed a classical libertarian and that I, I share many of the values espoused in this book. If I hate this and I find it to be a, a, a worrying and um, dystopic uh, ideal of, uh, of the world that I, I could not possibly get behind, if I find this to be a laughable reductionist idea of the world that only considers one viewpoint and not the other, that doesn't change who I am, it doesn't invalidate my intelligence, it just means that I'm less of the uh, classical libertarian that is depicted here and more of the modern libertarian who has a more moderate and uh, more critical viewpoint of the philosophy. Either way, I should read it. But it's not gonna que it's not gonna break my the fibre of who I am. <sighs> Book of the New Sun. This may make me question what is fantasy and what is sci-fi. It may be one hell of a trippy read. It may be a worryingly old read that might have some acronist anachronistic language that makes it something I'm dreading because I'm not sure whether or not I'm ready to read older um, literature because uh, I'm not used to reading stuff from the 80s or earlier and I'm not used to the language choice and the sentence structure and the, the, the way the prose is put together um, tends to make it much uh, much harder to get into 
I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to enjoy that. But if I hate this, it doesn't matter. This will not, this will not make me question anything. It will just, it will be an interesting conversation, regardless of how I feel about it. The same is true of, of Malaz and Book of the Fallen. It is one hell of a huge series, ten books long. And if I hate the first one, um, I don't have to read the rest. But if I love it, um, I can keep going and I can delve deep. But if I hate it, I know people who don't like it. I know that it's, it's not a universally loved series. I know that it's a matter of taste and a matter of opinion. So it doesn't matter how I feel about it. It's intimidating because it's complex. It's intimidating because it's dense, because it's very richly written. And it's something that I'm hoping to enjoy, but I'm not sure if I'm ready for it yet. I'm not sure if I have the time and the commitment to embed myself in that world. But none of these, none of them, will ever be as intimidating as War and Peace. Because this book may well make me question who I am and what I really feel. Because this will question whether or not I like the things I like, whether or not I understand the, the qualities of literature that I say I like and say I want. Because if I can't vibe with this book, if I can't understand and acknowledge the brilliance of this book, if I can't enjoy this book, it's my fault, not the book's. Because a book as famous, as loved, as revered as War and Peace, I don't have to love it. It could be a three and a half star for me. Maybe I don't vibe with the characters. Maybe I find uh, that the, the pacing isn't quite to my tastes. But I need to be at, at least be able to read it and understand why other people love it. If I can read it and go, I understand why everyone else loves this, but it's not to my personal tastes. It does these things slightly differently. It's uh, it, it, it does these plot points in a way that I found a little bit too slow going or a little bit too um, a little bit too uh, uh, focused on the, the military aspect or focused on the romance or whatever it is that it does that I find I don't like. If I can at least explain that, that's fine. But if I find that I read this and I just don't vibe with it and I don't know why, that's my identity down the fucking toilet. That's an intimidating book. So, I hope this was an interesting uh, video. If you've got some intimidating books in your library that really, really make your heart pound at the idea of reading, let me know what they are, because I'm interested. And, um, which of these ones should I read first? It's not going to be for a while yet. These are intimidating reads, and um, they're not on my next on my on my TBR. They're not in the next books I'm going to be reading. It's going to be a while before I pick any of these up. But when I do, which ones do you reckon I should pick up first? <sighs> Let's see what people feel, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.